Grisemi, and I'm going to talk about new features in NVMe 1.3 and some of the things that we're working on for the future uh, version of the spec. So, um, you know, as Dave mentioned, uh, the NVMe organization kind of has three specifications underneath it. We have the NVMe spec, which we refer to as the NVMe base spec, and it basically defines the NVMe architecture, the NVMe command set, the queuing interface, and basically how do you build a PCIe SSD. Uh, we also have the NVMe over fabric spec that basically takes the architecture and command set and shows you how to scale that over, um, over fabrics. Um, in addition, we have the NVMe MI spec at the bottom, which is the management interface spec, and that basically tells you how do you manage a PCI Express SSD. So I'm going to talk about the NVMe base spec, basically the core architecture and command set of NVMe. Uh, so this is a slide very similar to what Dave showed. Uh, we released NVMe 1.2 in November of 2014. Uh, we released 1.2.1 in May of 16. The goal of 1.2.1 was to really roll in a bunch of errata changes and to align the base spec with some of the work that's been going on in fabrics. Uh, so NVMe 1.3, which uh, was ratified in, in May of this year, is really the first major spec in, in about three years. Uh, so it's a major release for us. Uh, in addition, we're now working on new features for the next version of the spec. So the NVMe um, 1.3 spec consists of about over 20 technical proposals. So there's a lot of detail in NVMe 1.3, and I'm not going to be able to go into it in, in this presentation in any depth. I'm just going to give you kind of the highlights of new features. So as we know, uh, NVMe is designed to scale from client to high-end enterprise, uh, so we've added features for both of these. We've added uh, boot partitions and host-controlled thermal management, which I'll talk about later for client. Uh, for data center and enterprise, we added directives and virtualization, which I'll describe later, and we added emulated controller optimization. Really, the way to think about emulated controller optimization is these are features that you're not going to implement in any real NVMe controller. These are basically features that allow you to build a better NVMe para-virtualized driver uh, for virtualized environments. Uh, in addition to um, client and enterprise features, we added some deb debug features, all of which I'll describe a little later. Um, and we enhanced management, so we added device self-test. So device self-test is really a standardized way of initiating self-test on a SSD or on an NVMe drive to find out whether it's operating correctly. We added sanitize, which I'll describe a little later, and management enhancements. So really the goal of management enhancements is uh, we have this management interface spec, which um, to date has really dealt with out-of-band management. What we're finding is that people want to do those same things in band. So what management enhancements does is allow you to execute management interface commands in band through NVMe. So let's go on to our, let's go to our first uh, new feature, virtualization enhancements. So let me try to provide you with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so in, in cloud environments, uh, a lot of people are basically hosting virtual machines. And the name of the game in that business is over-provisioning, right? You want to host a lot of virtual machines. You want to get a lot of utilization on your hardware. You also want to be able to differentiate these virtual machines. So you want to allow people to come in with kind of low-end virtual machines with low-end performance, and then as they need more performance, they can buy more, uh, more performance and kind of scale up. So uh, using NVMe in virtualized environments is nothing new. It's been happening for years. One way to do this is, uh, as shown with virtual machine number one, is to basically run a standard NVMe driver in a guest OS and have the hypervisor emulate an NVMe uh, controller. Uh, the advantage of this is it allows you to run a standard NVMe driver. The disadvantage is that it's slow because you're now emulating uh, the NVMe controller and software. Uh, so another way to do this is with a para-virtualized driver. So this is basically loading a driver that understands that it's in a virtualized environment and can optimize that path. But the problem with both of these approaches is that the hypervisor is in the main data path. And as we get NVMe drives that are higher performance and lower latency, uh, this software can become a bottleneck. So what we've done in virtualization enhancements is basically standardize how, how, do, you, um, how do you provide direct access uh, from a virtual machine to an NVMe controller. Uh, so this is nothing new. In 2007, the PCI SIG standardized uh, single root IO virtualization. And basically what you do in SRIOV is you have a physical function and one or more virtual functions. The physical function is used to manage the device, and the virtual functions are basically used to directly assign to a virtual machine. And this allows the guest operating system running on the virtual machine to directly access um, the, the hardware without having to go through the hypervisor. Uh, so this is present in, um, in SRIOV and PCI-SIG since 2007. 
Uh, it's been in NVMe for a long time as well. In NVMe 1.1, we said that if you implement virtual functions, these will be complete NVMe controllers, so you can run a standard NVMe driver. But what's been missing is really how do you manage the, the entire drive? So um, if, you, um, if you think about it, um, you need, to, you need to basically control what resources are assigned where. So if you take an SRIOV drive from a vendor and you plug it into a hypervisor, you need to load a special, um, a special driver for that drive. So what we've done in virtualization enhancements is standardize how do you, the driver for the PF. So the idea is that, un, like with NVMe drives where you can just plug in a drive and it loads a standard driver, with um, the virtualization enhancements, you can just basically load a standard SRIOV drive and it'll run a standard um, driver within the hypervisor. So I've told you that um, really the advantage of um, managing this is in managing resources. So you might be thinking, what resources do you need to manage in an SRIOV drive? Well, remember we have some uh, virtual machines that have a few, you know, low performance, which maybe have low cores. And we have other virtual machines that have high performance. So as you know, by assigning more cores, we need more queues, more interrupts. So really management of an NVMe drive in an SRIOV case um, re revolves around assigning queues and assigning interrupts. So for a low performance uh, VM, you might want to assign a small number of queues. For a high performance VM, you can assign more queues, and you can do that using virtualization enhancements, using VQ sets and VI sets. So up to this point, I've really talked about managing in the context of SRIOV drives, but we've architected virtualization enhancements so that as new virtualization techniques become available, you can use that uh, with those techniques as well. Now let's shift gears to directives. So as we all know, passing information from the host to a drive can allow the drive to perform better. So one example of this is the, the deallocate function in data set management, which you may know in other standards as trim. Um, and we have other capabilities to pass information from the host to the drive. And over the years, people have come up with a variety of ideas of passing information. The problem has been that NVMe commands are 64 bits in size. So we've always been concerned, you know, we had to parcel out these bits and the commands very judiciously because we can't afford to allocate bits to a feature that either the industry doesn't adopt or it's tied to a particular type of NVM. So what we've done with directives is we've defined a 16-bit directive-specific field and a 4-bit directive type field that basically we can redefine based on the type of directive. Uh, so this will allow us to basically um, evolve and, and provide more information from the host to the drive to improve performance. Uh, the first directive we have is streams, so let me give you a little bit of motivation behind streams and describe how streams work. So imagine we had a, uh, a virtualized environment running um, four VMs, and each VM is generating sequential traffic, and we have one terabyte, a one terabyte drive associated with each VM. So since it's sequential traffic, irrespective of whether it's reads or writes, you're going to get great performance on these one terabyte drives. So as we all know, NAND density continues to increase. So now we want to take these four sequential workloads and move them onto one large drive. So as these sequential workloads get mixed together, it now creates a random workload, which is known as the I.O. Blender effect. And we all know that random workloads kind of don't perform really well on a drive. So the, motion, the motivation behind streams is how do we get that uh, same behavior on a large drive with multiple workloads that we got when each workload got its own dedicated drive. And the idea is streams. So with streams, we use a directive-specific field, and we pass a stream ID associated with each write. So let's take a look at how this would work. Let's say we had uh, three write streams, uh, two of them sequential, one random. Uh, on a normal drive, all of the writes associated with these streams would get mixed together and stored on flash blocks, or what we generically refer to as reclaim units. Um, because the lifetime of this data is different, you're going to wind up having to do garbage collection, which increases write amp. And with high write amp, you get lower performance, lower endurance, and worse QoS. So the idea with streams is that associated with each write, we associate a stream ID. And now the controller can basically uh, segregate those writes into the streams and write them onto different reclaim units. So now since uh, the write lifetime of the data is, is the same on the reclaim units, uh, we get very low write amp, which results in good performance and long endurance, uh, good endurance and good QoS. So that's really the motivation behind streams. Another new feature in NVMe 1.3 is sanitize. Uh, so really, the objective of sanitize is to provide a way to eradicate all user data when you're repurposing a drive or it's the end of life of a drive. So rather than shredding a, physically shredding a drive, you can just sanitize it and, and uh, dispose of it. Um, sanitize um, 
performs this eradication using one of three methods. Methods: uh, the first is block erase, which is just erasing, um, you know, the physical media. Uh, you can do a crypto erase, which throw away, uh, throws away the crypto key and destroys the data in that manner. And the third is overwrite, where you're actually physically overwriting data. So a lot of you who are familiar with NVMe are probably thinking, well, you know, we've had secure erase in NVMe format. Why do we need sanitize, and how is it different? And there's three primary differences. Uh, the first is when you initiate a sanitize operation uh, and you reset the controller or you do a power cycle, the sanitize continues to run after that. So you can't get at the data um, after a reset or a power cycle. The second difference is um, a format basically um, erases the data in a namespace, but a sanitize does that, plus it also erases all user data in any cache or buffer in the SSD. And the third difference is <clears throat> Associated with data that you've written to an SSD, you may have logged data, you may have uh, written information in log pages uh, about the data, and that metadata can be used as a, as a potentially to uncover some secrets that are in the data. So Sanitize also eliminates all of that information. So you can think of Sanitize as kind of a, a better version, a more secure version of secure rates that was previously in format. So those are kind of um, enterprise features. Now let's shift gears to more client features. Uh, the first client feature is boot partitions. And basically what boot partitions does is it allows you to get fast, easy access to a portion of NVM on an NVM SSD. So you don't need the basic, you don't need to enable the controller, turn on IO queues and whatever to go start reading data. Basically the way boot partitions work is you can select one of two boot partitions uh, you select the offset in the boot partition, the amount of data you want to move, and an address in controller memory. All of this is done through CSR registers, and you basically kick it off, and you pull a status register until the DMA operation finishes. And the idea is to provide a very simple loading mechanism for, for boot loaders. Um, and the idea is to replace spy flash and EEPROMs in a lot of applications. So a lot of you are thinking, like, well, I have a two and a half inch drive. Why am I replacing, um, you know, spy and EEPROM with this two and a half inch drive? But you need to keep in mind that, you know, in a lot of client applications, we may have NVMe drives that are actually BGA devices. Um, with boot partitions, you can upload the boot, you can update the boot partition using firmware image download. Uh, we also have the capability to lock and unlock a boot partition. So. Um, a user wouldn't, um, you know, by mistake, overwrite a boot partition or have malicious code updated. Another um, client feature is host-controlled thermal management. Now, NVMe has a variety of power management techniques, um, but what this one does is it basically allows the host to set the temperature of the drive and allow the drive to try to maintain <clears throat> that temperature. So the way that works is we have two thermal management thresholds, uh, thermal management threshold one, thermal management threshold two, uh, the host sets them both, and if the drive gets the thermal uh, management threshold one, the drive will start trying to reduce power to reduce the temperature of the drive. Um, if it's unable to do so and the temperature keeps going up and we hit thermal uh, threshold number two, um, the drive is allowed to basically throttle performance. Now, how you actually reduce the temperature of a drive is implementation specific, but in most cases it'll revolve around some sort of um, throttling. Uh, so the use case for this is imagine you have a laptop um, and you're doing a lot of IOs, basically it allows the host to set the maximum temperature so that the SSD doesn't get really hot and, and uh, uh, annoy you. We've added a number of new debug features. So timestamp is allows the host to pass time of day information to the SSD. So it's basically the number of milliseconds since uh, January 1st, 1970. Um, that allows you to log, uh, to correlate log information to what's going on on the host or on other drives. Uh, we've updated um, the error logs to provide better error logging information, so when a command fails, you can get more information about what actually went wrong. We also added telemetry. So the way to think about telemetry is that, you know, all most SSDs that are shipping today have some sort of crash dump information. If something goes wrong, there's a log that you can pull from the SSD to kind of figure out what went wrong. But all of this is currently vendor-specific. What telemetry does is basically standardize how do you pull this log information uh, from an SSD. So you can now do that in standard drivers. So up to this point, I've kind of provided an overview of features in NVMe 1.3. Now let's take a look at some of the new features that we're working on for the spec beyond 1.3. Um, a big focus is IO determinism. And really, you can think of IO determinism as quality of service. And one of the big things in quality of service is IO consistency. So what IO consistency means is having all read operations you know, execute in the same amount of time and all write operations execute in the same amount of time. What you see on a lot of SSDs is that you get uh, excursions. 
So uh, a read um, typically would, would finish in an average amount of time, but every now and then you get uh, reads that take a very long amount of time. So um, one contribution to these outliers is the fact that you may have multiple workloads accessing the same physical media. So let's say you have a NAND device, and one workload does a write that happens to go to that NAND device, and then another workload happens to try to do a read um, that happens to be on that same NAND device. Now, you can do a program suspend to try to get the data, but the bottom line is there's going to be some sort of QoS excursion as a result of that. The idea um, behind NVM sets is that we will, lot, you can think of it as physically partitioning the NVM media and controller resources to, to provide isolation between NVM sets. Uh, so a controller can have multiple NVM sets. You can put multiple namespaces on the NVM set. And if you, if you have an application accessing, for example, namespace A1, it in no way impacts uh, QoS associated with namespace B1. Now, obviously, there's some shared resources like PCI Express. But you know, at kind of a gross level, it really provides an improvement in I.O. consistency. So the previous mode, the previous uh, um, uh, feature associated with IO determinism really dealt with two applications kind of hitting physical media. Um, but sometimes you may have um, the drive itself impacting uh, one workload. So example of that is garbage collection. Uh, so we wanted to provide a way to deal with that. Uh, one way is um, predictable latency mode. And basically what this does is it segments uh, drive time into deterministic window and non-deterministic window. During the deterministic window, you get great QoS, and during the non-deterministic window, you do all the background operations, and you may have not so great QoS. So you may be saying, well, this didn't really solve my problem. You just kind of gave me a good time and a bad time. But the idea is that if you have replicated data on multiple SSDs, you can provide uh, access to your data always within the deterministic window. And this will be discussed later um, in, in this track in more depth. Uh, another thing that we're working on is NVMe and high-end storage systems. So here's a picture of a high-end storage array. Um, and you know, you'd expect NVMe SSDs in the back end, and we're seeing that. But the other thing that we're seeing is that with the introduction of NVMe over fabrics, we're seeing NVMe in the front end. So now you have hosts looking at a storage array, and they see it as an NVM subsystem. Now, you know, these storage arrays are kind of refrigerator-sized boxes that are cabled together and fill a room, right? So that's a single NVM subsystem, which is actually very different than uh, an ASIC that you may have on an NVMe drive. And it has different requirements. So one of these is um, that coming into a particular port, you may have uh, different performance. So for example, let's say you take namespace C. If you come in through port Z, you may have great performance to namespace Z. But if you come in through ports X and Y, you may cross some physical media um, in this subsystem and have worse performance. So with asynchronous namespace access, what we're doing is we're providing that information to the host. So when the host has multiple paths that it can access a namespace with, it can figure out which path is the best one to use. Um, the other thing that happens in these uh, large arrays is that you may, you may have a fault that physically partitions the system for some amount of time. Um, and so we're also trying to deal with that, and that's something we're working on. Final new feature that I'll describe is persistent memory region. And what persistent memory regions does is basically provide byte addressable persistent memory onto PCI Express. So we introduced controller memory buffers in NVMe 1.2. And basically what a CMB is, it's just some read-write memory that's on the controller um, that you can put command and control uh, information to and the controller can fetch. Uh, what PMR does is very similar. It exposes a bar on PCI Express with read-write memory um, that you can read and write. You can also put um, command data there. But basically, the idea is that if you do a controller level reset or a power cycle, after that reset or power cycle, the data will still be there. So it's persistent memory, and it's byte addressable. And you can use it for anything you want. In summary, uh, NVMe continues to evolve with innovative new data center enterprise and client features. I think that uh, you know, if you look at the rate of new features, I would say that you know, we're adding new features now faster than we ever have before to try to address the various markets that NVMe is serving. Uh, NVMe was ratified, um, 1.3 was ratified on May 1st. It's available from nvmexpress.org. You can download it for free. Uh, it's probably a good place to look at any of the features that I've described here associated with NVMe 1.3. And we're working on a variety of new features for the next version of NVM. Thank you.